Welcome to another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring human beings, not just focusing on their success, but more important, shining a spotlight on the road they traveled to get there. Now, this week's guest, <clears throat> I really needed, not want, but needed to get him on the program because I know him as this A-list actor on a number one TV show, but I had no idea of his backstory. And the more I got to learn about who he is as a human being, the obstacles, the adversities, the challenges that he came through as a kid and all of the service he's given to the country, to his people, I was fascinated and intrigued. I'm excited to have this conversation, but it's just one of those conversations that I'm looking forward to because it makes me feel good as a human being. Please welcome to this week's Power Move Makers, Mr. Hisham Tafik. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Nobody don't just have the name Hisham from nowhere. This name got to mean something. So let's start off right there. And is, is it a shortened version of it? Do you got a nickname? Like, tell me where this comes from. Uh, the, the short story is my father was a student of Malcolm X. Um, my father then was inspired by Malcolm, received a scholarship from Malcolm and went to Egypt where he studied at Al-Azhar University, converted to Islam, um, came back to Harlem, founded a mosque, had five boys. I'm the oldest and my name is Hisham Taufik. Hisham means one who breaks bread and Taufik uh, in Arabic means lucky or blessed. Hisham, one who breaks, one who breaks one bread? Who, one who breaks bread, meaning one who shares. One who shares and Taufik, Meaning one who is blessed or lucky or... Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, is there a shortened version of that or is everybody just call you Hisham? Uh, for the most part, everybody called me Taufik. Um, I, I would say just because high school, I was an athlete, played football, everybody calls you by your last name. So a lot of pe people just call me Taufik or Fik or, you know, that type. Most people call me Taufik. Okay, dope. You know, before I get into your story, you just said something that was crazy. Your father, did he study under Malcolm X? Like, did, did he actually know the man? Did he learn from him? Or did he just study his teachings? No, no, no. He, he, knew, he knew Malcolm. He knew Betty. He, actually, I know all of Malcolm's daughters. I know Camilla. I, you know, he, he um, after Malcolm was assassinated, he kind of took over with teaching the daughters Arabic, I think, in 1964 in Ebony Magazine, if you look it up. There's a picture of my father, Betty Shabazz, and the three girls sitting down while he's giving them an Arabic lesson. So he was good friends and a student of Malcolm. And when Malcolm came back from his studies in Egypt and really learning about um, Sunni Islam and Muslims, um, he had impressed the people in Egypt. So the um, dignitaries in Egypt said, hey, here's, here's four scholarships to give to your students. And my father was one of the students that got a scholarship who then followed in Malcolm steps and went to Mecca and did the same studies. Oh, that's amazing. That is amazing. Um, coming up, did you, did you understand the significance of this? Did you understand like? No, my father unfortunately um, passed away when I was a senior in high school. So I didn't really learn about the history of his connection to Malcolm and Betty um, until later, later in my life. Got you. Did you ever have an uh, opportunity to meet Betty? No, I've, 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 I know the daughters. I've met the daughters. I speak to the daughters, but I, I never met Betty or, or um, no. Okay. A lot of people are going to know you watching this off the bat, Blacklist, Dembe. On the show, your character is African, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. You have straight up African features, you are a, a handsome black man. In real life, are you African or are you just African-American? 
Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm African American. My mother's from Savannah, Georgia, from the Geechee lands. And we, if you do your history, we know that a lot of um, enslaved uh, Africans came in through uh, uh, South Carolina and the ports in, in the Geechee, Geechee Islands. Uh, my mother is my complexion, same features. Um, so of course, my father did research and I've done research. So we've tied my my ancestors back to Kush and Ghana and, and places like that. Um, but I, I, I guess I attribute my strong features to, to my mother and my father, but specifically on my mother's side, um, down there in Savannah, Georgia, where you know a lot of our people came through. Wow, how about that? Uh, you have, you have, you have, I know you mentioned that your dad passed. Your mom, she passed early in your life as well, correct? Yeah, my, mo my mother was a victim of uh, uh, gun violence when I was four years old. Okay, it, 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 was her, I guess, killer ever brought to justice? Did you ever get any of the backstory? No, I, I honestly was told that she died in a car crash all my life. And it wasn't until I needed her death certificate to fill out my application for college that I saw in the death certificate that she died from multiple gunshots. Um, and then that's when I started digging and, and found out that she had some sisters in Savannah, Georgia, and I connected with that family and found out that she was, uh, well, I knew, yeah, that's when I found out that, you know, she was, was murdered and it was never solved. Oh, sorry to hear that, brother. My condolences. Thank you. How does, you've achieved a high level of success in your life. Uh, and when I say success, I don't just mean it monetarily. Uh, I think that success comes <clears throat> in all different ways, just in terms of happiness, uh, in terms of service. You seem to be a very well-rounded and successful gentleman. And you're doing your thing career-wise, but... So many people that I know, especially when they lose mama early, they're never the same. It, it's something about losing their mother early that just changes them. But you lost both of your parents relatively early in your life. How, you know, what is that like, number one? How did you go from, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it, being an orphaned child, oldest of five brothers, to stay insane, to doing the right thing, yeah, well, not I'm, hitting the streets. Well, I think you're. I think you're my age, so um, you know, yeah. I'm I'm 51. So I was growing up in the 70s in Harlem, where everybody was addicted to heroin. This was before crack, so it was, really it was heroin. It was dust. Um, seeing people nod out on the corner. Um, I saw a lot of that, you know, the vacant buildings, the, you know, people getting shot. But um, what I realized later in my years, what, which, which helped me kind of avoid a lot of those pitfalls was um, my father was a very, um, he was a special man. He was a man ahead of his times. Um, and I think he understood and knew that in raising a family that it even takes more than two parents. Um, so what my father did uh, in, in the 70s, he, uh, there was three vacant buildings in Harlem, drug infested buildings. And I think he went to the city and the city was like, if you could clean them out, get the dope dealers out, the drug, you can have them. Um, and he got some other Muslim brothers from Cleveland, Ohio and Atlanta, and they all teamed up and they cleaned out three vacant buildings in Harlem. In these three vacant buildings, then were all Muslim families. They had, a, we had a school, we had a mosque, we had a restaurant, we had everything in these three buildings. So even though I was surrounded by all of this havoc and drugs and crime and poverty, um, I kind of grew up in this little safe haven village. Um, and it was a village that was respected by the outsiders where they knew, hey, that's a Muslim community over there all the businesses we doing. Um, my father and brothers, they painted the sidewalk green that covered all three buildings. And everybody knew that you couldn't sell dope on the green, you couldn't hang on the green, you couldn't even step on the green if you was doing something illegal. And of course, that came out of a lot of um, 
physical interaction sometimes, but um, it, it, it was respected. Um, so I say that to, to give you the backdrop that when my mother and father died, I was still living in a community with all of these Muslim brothers and sisters who um, in some aspect um, looked out for me um, and made sure, even though when my father died, he was the leader of the community, a lot of people um, were traumatized, a lot of people were hurt. Um, but in some way, the spirit of what he created kind of guided me and protected me. Now I got in trouble, I got arrested, I got in trouble, I, I did stuff. Um, and I was just blessed not to end up in a coffin or behind bars. And um, I didn't do anything crazy, crazy, but um, I, I, you know, a favor was shown upon me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and based on who my father was and me being the oldest, um, I just knew I was anointed to do some special stuff. So I've always um, gone out. And, and you got to also remember, in creating this village, I knew way back about my ancestors. I knew about the importance of Africa. My father took my whole family to live in Saudi Arabia for a year. So I lived in Mecca for when I was 12 years old for about a year. So I got to travel, I got to see the world. Um, I understood that there was more than just the block. Um, and I understood that he, I, anything that I wanted to do, I could achieve. Um, he put me in the, bout, in the Boy Scouts early. He taught me how to swim. I was a lifeguard for, for three years at a camp. So I was filled up with to the brim of this world is yours. You can go out and get it. But at the same time, understanding um, that I'm a black man, what the pitfalls are, what the hurdles are, but also that I'm, empo I'm empowered to almost do anything I, I believe in and can do anything I want. So all of that was, was buried in me. And as I grew older, it just started to grow. And um, that's a huge reason why I do have some type of level of success. Now I will say in that community, there are tons of people who um, fell victim to drugs, fell victim to crime, um, are locked up, um, don't have the, the, the type of success I am may not still be connected to their Islam or their deem or their religious way of life that they were raised with. But um, I'm one of the person who, who, who came out of that, 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 that fire and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make the best out of it. Are you still connected to Islam? Absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, I was looking forward to this interview and it gets better and better the more that we speak. I, you know, you are, you're, you're, you're homegrown. You came up in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s in Harlem for real. Like this is the crack era. This is, this is Harlem for real. Yes, and sir. as I'm listening to you talk in far too often, especially within our community, you know, the, the mother, that's the pillar. That's the, that's the person that holds the family together. That's the person that is uh, around and you have the most relation with in terms of your upbringing. But I hear you speak with so much reverence about your father, a black man, somebody who was ahead of their time. And it, you know, he passed when you were what, 17 years old? Yeah, 18. 18 years, this is, this is a guy that instilled so much into you in a very, very short amount of time. And I love to hear this because whenever fathers, it doesn't matter the race, but when black fathers step up and they produce products like yourself, I just think it's so admirable. And I'm glad that you took a moment to just share with us who he was and what he meant to you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that because, you know, one of the things I love doing is, especially even to this day, Sunday mornings, I love walking around Harlem on Sunday mornings. And for some reason, Sundays are always quiet because Saturday's the bang, bang night. <laughs> so, um, and one thing I observed on Sunday mornings and sometimes during the week is I would just be, you know, maybe because of the, the influence my father had me, I always 
was not blown away, but it stood out how many black men I saw with their kids, even young black men. I love it. You know, hip jeans down, whatever. I would always be walking around. I'm seeing all of these black men with their kids. And I'm like, this don't fit the narrative that I keep hearing. Um, not saying that there aren't men that aren't doing their job, but from what I can see, there are a lot of men who are doing their job. Yes, so, I don't, you know, yes, my father was special. And I say he was special as far as just his foresight and understanding that it takes a village um, and teaching me about my ancestry and, 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 and all of that. But there's a lot of black men out there who are fathers, wonderful fathers and doing the do, but their stories aren't highlighted. It doesn't fit the narrative. So they're, they're, they're swept under the rug. Yeah, but that's why it's so important for people like yourself to share that part of the story because it's, it's necessary. It really is because the, the, the broader lens of this nation will vilify, demonize, and make you believe that within our community, there are not a lot of Black fathers who are stepping up. And I know that to be false, just like you. So I, I, again, I thank you for sharing that. Uh, you are 113th in what, St. Nick? Yeah. Where'd you go to school? Cause you're a local boy. Yeah, so I, you know, like I, first of all, I was homeschooled. So really? at that, those three buildings, we had a school in there. So everybody was homeschooled. We had a, a, a teacher who taught us. My father taught Arabic, science, and history and then we had another teacher sister she taught everything else <laughs> so, and we were homeschooled up until the sixth grade so then after sixth grade i went to public school i first went to uh uh my father did research he sent me to a place called a computer school which was a small school inside a school called is44 on 77 between columbus and after that we, we were in the basement learning about computers before computers were big um, and I went to that school. And then when I graduated from there, I went to Manhattan Center for Math and Science on 116th and First Avenue uh, in, in East Harlem. Okay, stop there for a second. Manhattan Center, that's Dame Dash. That's, I was in that's, school. That's Mace, I think, Cam, Cam. Yep. So I was, I was in school with, with Dame. Um, there's a lot of other legends that came from there, some basketball players. Um, uh, I was, I was, Mason, all of them came after I graduated, but I was in there with, with some, a lot of, a lot of dudes. <laughs> wow, how about that? Um, you play sports while you were there? Yeah, I played football. Start? Starting quarterback. Get out of here. Yes, sir. Are you serious? Yeah. Went 8 0 out JV season. Uh, when I went to varsity, I broke my thumb, I think, at the first game. And then the next year, broke my ribs, collapsed lung, ended my football season. <laughs> Got it. So high school was pretty good for you. you, you you're know. starting quarterback in Manhattan Center. Like, you're pretty popular in that school. Absolutely. How does a person like you, number one, because I know your backstory, you served in Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from as opposed to continuing your education? Because most people at that point, they're thinking, you know, let me go to college. Let me try to get this full ride. Maybe I got a shot at the NFL. Where, where does your life switch? Yeah, I had, go, I had all those dreams. I thought I was going to the NFL. Um, my senior year, once I broke my ribs, collapsed my lung, that was also the year my father passed away. Um, so then that's where all the guidance kind of fell out the bag, where um, I was injured, I couldn't play football. Um, as a dare, I took a dance class, I fell in love with African dance my senior year. And when graduation came, because I had messed up after my father passed away, I had to go to summer school. Mm -hmm. I, think I, I was accepted to Hampton, a school in Atlanta, a school in Pennsylvania, and I think Cornell, but all of them required me to go to summer school. Um, that same summer, my dance company, Repertory Dance Company of East Harlem was going to France. 
Um, so I didn't have nobody to guide me. I was like, I'm not going to summer school. Um, I fell in love with dance. Football was in the rear mirror. So I went to France with my dance company. Um, when I came back from France, you know, I did what everybody else did, got the jobs, athletes foot, Yankee Stadium. And it was just one, at one moment, I was like, this ain't cutting it. Like, this is not what I want to do with my life. And uh, I just jumped up and joined the Marine Corps. It was gone the next day. And, and it just happened like that. It's crazy because I'm from the Bronx and um, you just mentioned Yankee Stadium. I used to work at Yankee Stadium <laughs> too, <laughs> selling sodas. Yeah, ice cream, ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you jump up, you join, you join the Marines? Yes, sir. Okay, I can't, I can't, I can't, because I was going to go into this Marine story, but I can't let this thing pass. How tall are you? Six feet. You're six feet tall. You're an athlete. Mm -hmm. I, I heard you say that you did it on a dare, but dancing, African dance at that, that ain't cool. Like you really did that on a dare and fell in love with it? Yeah, I, I remember there was a poster on the, you know, they used to cover up the window because all the dudes used to walk by, look in the window, look at the girls. Yeah. And on it, they used to cover it up with posters. And one poster had Herschel Walker and, and, a, and, a, and tights with a ballerina. And I was like, oh, Herschel Walker do it. I was like, he a football player. I was like, there's girls in there. F that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this dance class. And something about the African drum, I mean, to this day, I mean, you know, I went to Ghana last year, just something about the African drum and the connection to Africa. And, and um, that just, it, it overpowered my love for football. Um, and I can't explain it. It, it. it wasn't even no second thoughts. I just, I just jumped into it. And I didn't even think, you know, you know, I remember dancing. A lot of people used to tease you, call you gay. And, yep. but I had came like, again, I came from this community where we had got bullied our whole life just from being Muslim and wearing, having a different, like, we didn't have TVs in our house. We had to eat kosher foods. I had whole wheat bread. I had natural peanut butter. I had rice cakes. I had tofu. So I had been getting teased all my life. So when it came to taking dance, I didn't care if you called me gay. I didn't care if you teased me. I, like I said, I was the quarterback on the team. Nobody who was gonna step to me. And if somebody mm -hmm. did, I was used to defending myself and and my beliefs and 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 believing and doing what I wanted to do. So that wasn't even a question. I then, I mean, if you you do some research, you could speak to anybody in my high school. I went from the quarterback being the star to dancing at assemblies and being having the same star power. So it was like even was, while in high school. Yeah. Man, that's 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 a huge transition. Was you wearing them same tights? Yeah, I had like in my dance. I couldn't just do African dance. I did my dance teacher made me do modern. But here's the thing, I'll never forget. My African dance teacher was a black man named Al. This dude was built like Emmett Smith. He was just diesel, big, huge, flexible, and it was a black man doing African dance. So. That might have also helped because I was I was like, oh wow, okay, this is, you know, and he seemed heterosexual. So it was like it was a smooth transition. Um, but it was it, it just came natural, man. It was, it was, it was just in my DNA. I mean, you I know, did for 15 years after that. You said you said you danced for 15 years after that? Yeah. So, so let me ask you, because I'm such a firm believer, and I preach this all the time, especially to our audience. Um, our audience, are, they're comprised of dreamers and, and people who are trying to better their life. They, 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 they are entrepreneurs. They're people who are trying to achieve high-level success. But I always say, you have to trust the process. And what I mean by that is you don't know why God has you on the journey that he has you on. You don't know, because in your case, your pops pass, <clears throat> you have a collapsed lung, you get injured. And on a dare, somebody says, I dare you to take this dance class in which you fall in love. And what I mean, or where I'm going with this is, is this also where you fell in love with the arts? Because I know dance and, and uh, 
theater and acting, they, they're all part of the family of the arts. So is this where you found that same love for acting? I, I believe so. I think it was twofold. I, I remember the first time I performed, well, I even have to trace back. My father used to have me perform, you know, part of my training was getting in karate class very early. And my mm -hmm. father used to go around and do these lectures and speak at different organizations. And before he spoke, he would always have me open up with a kata, you know, a performance of karate moves. So that might have been my first introduction to performing. But then in high school, I remember I did a poem uh, and I was in love with the, the English teacher and I did this poem, uh, Maya Angelou's Why the Cape Bird Sings. And I remember learning this poem and, and performing it and it just felt extremely empowering. So I think that was a seed that was planted. And then of course, dance, yes, that was another seed that was planted. Yeah, it's all, it's all performing, it, you know, it, it's, it's amazing that these seeds that are planted in us, you don't know where they're gonna blossom, where, you know, your life, you can look back and say, I got it now. Mm -hmm. You know, because hindsight is always 2020. But sometimes you just really do have to trust the process. You go on. <clears throat> How long are you in the service? Um, a funny thing is originally I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, but um I just remember the commitment commitment being too long. So I joined the Marine Corps uh, as a reservist. Um, so I did about a year and a half of training. But when I came home and was about to enroll in college, that's when we I got the letter about Desert Storm. So then my, my reserve unit was activated and we were sent to Kuwait. Wow. How long were you over there? How many tours? Uh, I was only in Kuwait for one tour, about seven, eight months. You know, and before we go further, thank you for your service. I told you that offline, but you know, this is, we're getting into the part of the story that really, uh, you know, I, I was like, I like this dude. <laughs> so I, I want to kind of move it along because I need to get to, to the firefighter years. Mm -hmm. When you come home, I know for a stint, you were a CO. Yeah. How was that? And, and where, were you, where, where were you a corrections officer at? Sing Sing. So you were up in Austin. Yeah, I was with the big boys. <laughs> <laughs> I, was with, I was with everybody from my block. That's what I was about <laughs> to ask you. Like, it ain't no way in the world that you, you up in Sing Sing wearing the uniform and you're not bumping into everybody from the hood. Yes, sir. Oh, but, man. you know, it, it, two things happen. Um, I'm bumping in everybody from the hood, uh -huh. but also there's a, a Muslim population in there. They knew my father. Um, so they had a tremendous amount of respect for my father and the mosque I came from. And then also the Imam that replaced my father also worked in the city jails and used to come through Sing Sing too. So I think just because I was Muslim that afforded me some type of protection um, and then two, um, yeah, you know, everybody from the block was up in there. I ran, in, I ran into dudes that used to beat me up that I used to hustle with. Um, but you know, that's 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 how it unfolded. Um, and you know, it, it was it was it was a little weird, a little dangerous at times. Even to this day, I can walk by and I can see somebody, and I remember them from from being in A block or B block. Wow. Um, so. Um, it just, you know, I, I got out of there <laughs> as quick as I could. <laughs> okay, what got you out of there? Is is, is it your is is it the job at the in, in in the fire department? Yeah. So what happens when I came home from the Marine Corps? I took corrections, Port Authority, police. Um, I took all of the exams. I didn't take the firefighter exam. The only reason I found out about the firefighter exam was because my brother went to Julia Richmond High School. He came home with a card one day, and I look at the card, and it was like. Uh, from the Vulcan Society. If you want to be a firefighter, call this number. And I was like, oh shit. Like, I like this dirty adrenaline type of stuff. I was like, I want to be a firefighter too. So I just filled out the card and sent it in. So corrections called me first. Um, but you know, then when the fire department called me, I was like, I'm out of here. I'm gonna switch over to the fire department. So I just I just left and moved over. Okay. I gotta ask because you're a real 
you were a real firefighter. Like you weren't on the job for a year or two passing through. You retired from the department, correct? Yeah, I did 20 years. 20 years. Help me on it because I don't know too many black firefighters. And when I was researching you, you are the real deal. You got the whole get up on the, the, the heavy jackets, the fireman's hat, the whole, and you used to drive. Yeah. So what happened is um, that was one of my attractions to the fire department was I've, I've always been attracted to things where there ain't no black people. <laughs> you know, even the Marine Corps was the last branch of service to integrate. Um, so in the fire department, one of the things my mentor told me when I was interested in, he was like, look, this is one of the best jobs in the world, but less than 2% are African-American. And I was like, wow, usually when there's not a lot of black folks, you know, it probably is a great job and I want to enjoy those benefits. Um, so out of 10,000 New York City firefighters, less than 200 are black. Um, so uh, I was only black in my firehouse for, for a number of years, but um, what happens is after you get a lot of time, you then can become what they call a seated chauffeur. You can become a chauffeur, usually senior men and chauffeurs. Um, so I just worked my way up, went back to school. They sent me to school as a sh uh, to get chauffeur training. And then I just drove the fire truck for, for the last couple of years. Can you give me an idea? Uh, like, what is, what is an average day, if there's an average day, in the fire department. And I ask you this because, especially coming from our hood, we know what the police do. We're very familiar with them. But the firemen, they show up and they're kind of in the background. They're there, but they're not there. They're there when you need them, but then they kind of slip into the back and you just see these guys and you know that they're necessary, but I never got a real feel for outside of fighting fires. How does y'all day look? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a lot to uncover in what you said. One, I think the, the, the interesting thing about you said is you don't know they're in the background. And I, I think that is, um, that is um, intentional. And that's why I never even thought about being a firefighter. And that's why a lot of people of color don't think about it. When you walk by a firehouse, usually the doors are closed. A lot of us don't even go in a firehouse. We're not invited in a firehouse. We don't know. Um, yeah. So uh, a average, there is no average day you can say, but for, I can tell you for that what an average day may look like is you have two shifts. You have an eight to six, and then you have a 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. the next. Okay, so an average day in the fire department is you report to work at 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, first thing you do is a roll call. You check all the equipment check your mask, you check your tools, you have a little breakfast, um, you clean the whole firehouse. Um, then if you have inspections, we might go do inspections. If we're gonna drill, we might drill. But other than that, you're, you're waiting for a call. So um, by the time I got on the job in 96, we had just merged with EMS. So now we were responding to not just fires, you know, gunshots, stabs, car accidents, heart attacks, trouble breathing, uh, broken arm, any and any type of 911 medical emergency the fire department is responding to. So your day can be filled up with car accidents, water leaks, a fire, somebody got bit by a dog, somebody got shot. Um, it's just a whole list of different things. Again, you're probably the only black firefighter I know. Is this a job you would recommend to people in our community, both men and women? Absolutely. The first thing I did, uh, 1998, I joined the first recruitment team um, because you gotta remember, the fire department said, we don't have a problem getting people. <laughs> so, but the Vulcan Society, the Organization of Black Firefighters is saying, okay, but we have a problem getting people of color. So I joined the first recruitment unit in 1998 and I left the firehouse for a year. Um, and what I did is I drove around the barbershops, schools, churches, mosques, bus stations, train stations, libraries. And all we did was also like the Nation of Islam. We just stood on the corner with tables and pamphlets um, and just begged our people to um, get the job. And once we tell people the salary you get, how many days you work, your medical benefits, 
most people don't even know we get six weeks paid vacation a year a year wow okay so, so, so sell me real quick i know you've been off the job for a little while uh-huh sean prez is walking down the street I, what's first, the sales pitch here what what, 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 what are you telling me to I get say, me to want to take this I test say, i say look hey man why don't you come take this test oh what is that i said this is new york city firefighter oh i don't want to be a firefighter i ain't trying to run in no burning building hold up look that's not all we do we don't just run into burning buildings. And if we do run into burning buildings, we are well-trained. It's just like a basketball team. You have a center, a guard, a forward, everybody got a position and that whole team can't win unless that every, all those positions are functioning the same. It's the same with the fire department. You have a, a nozzle man, you have a backup, you have a chauffeur, you have a roof. You have all of these positions and they work together. We're not running in no burning building. I, I'm not trying to die. Um, so that's my first thing. Then I say, we do medical emergencies too. Then I got to bring them in with this. I say, look, I get six weeks paid vacation, six weeks. That's a month and two weeks and I can do anything I want in those six weeks. I can also break it up three weeks here in October, three weeks in July. You do whatever you want with your six weeks. My six weeks, I went to Little Rock, Arkansas, I did a play. Got paid for doing the play, got paid for the city. Benefits, it's harder to talk to young people about benefits because they don't understand about medical, dental. I got, I got benefits for the rest of my life. Next thing I talk to them. Hold on, hold on, slow down. You currently? As a retiree, I have medical benefits for the rest of my life. Keep talking. So then the next thing I talk to them to hook them is the salary. I think at the time it was making maybe 60, 70 K, but with overtime, you can easily make a hundred thousand dollars. Now, here's the thing. I asked them how many days a week you think a firefighter works? Five days? Nope. A firefighter works, we get a calendar for the whole year. My calendar says I work two days, nine to five, I'm off two days. Then I work two nights and then I'm off three days. Now, long short story is if I combine my calendar, I can do what I call a 24 hour shift. I can come in Monday night, get off Tuesday night. If I do six 24 hour shifts in a month, that's all I have to do for a month of work. Get out of here. They call mutuals. I can do six 24 hour shifts. So for instance, I'm working Monday and my son needs to go to Sesame Place with his preschool and they're looking for volunteers. I call up John. Yo, John, I'm working Monday nine to five. Can you work for me Monday nine to five? John says, yeah, he's Sean, I, I work for you. You know what? I'm working Wednesday nine to five. Can you work Wednesday nine to five? Yeah, I can do that. Just like that, I'm off Monday. I can take my son to Sesame Place and no bosses get involved. There's no permission from an officer. That's between me and John. Now, I can also call John and say, hey, John, I'm working Monday and Tuesday. I don't want to work Monday and Tuesday. I, can I work all day Monday? You work all day Tuesday and we do it that way. John says, yeah, that's cool. So now instead of working Monday and Tuesday, nine to five, I work all day Monday. I have an extra day off Tuesday now. So if you do that six times, you will find out that the whole month is over. So that month, the rest of the month is you. No, no. What I'm saying is in those 30 days, uh -huh. you have to work six 24 hour shifts. Correct. And you will fulfill your obligation of 40 hours and get a full paycheck. Wow. I, you know, I don't know where y'all was when I was coming up. <laughs> you must have, it's made of that. Where was you stationed at? Was you stationed in Harlem? I know you were born and raised in Harlem. In Harlem. I, was, I was in Harlem. I was on 143rd between 7th and 8th Avenue. Oh, so you was right in your hood. Drew Hamilton Projects. Nice. Oh, you know, while we're on the subject of, uh, it's a couple of roads I want to go down. I asked you to sell me on this because I noticed with firemen, you guys, there's an affinity for the job that you don't find anywhere else. And one of your fellow actors, Steve Buscemi, you know, this is a guy who, he's been in every movie you can think of. Um, hit TV shows from The Sopranos to Reservoir Dogs to so many. But you always see him speaking so highly of that brotherhood, mm -hmm. of that department. Number one, have you ever got a chance to meet him? 
work with him. And you guys are on two, I mean, you're, you're brothers, black, he's white, you're black, but within that, I'm sure you guys don't see color. You're seeing, we go into them buildings together. Yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, when you're doing a job where it's life or death and you mess with fire, uh, and you got to also understand the fire department, and this is another reason why I think people of color were left out of it for so long. There's a book called Firefight um, that I read, which is the history of, of, of the fire department and, and African-Americans in the job. And there's another book written by uh, another brother, but it's about a, a police officer named Samuel Battle, who was the first black police officer. And one of the differences that they allowed, that I learned that they allowed more blacks to become police officers than firefighters was in the fire department, you sleep together, meaning you have a bunk room, you eat together where you sit down. And back in those days, you know, it wasn't rocking like that. You know, they had something called black beds, which a black person was supposed to sit in. Some firehouses didn't let people sit at the table and eat with the same utensils and plate. So it was really bad, but, but that also is the reason for the camaraderie and the brotherhood and sisterhood. It's because you guys are living together. Police department, you go to work, you're changing your locker, you go. Fire department, you go to work, you eating together, you're sleeping together, your showers in there, the study room is there, you're living in a house, it's a firehouse. So of course, there's gonna be a different type of bond, um, which, but also it creates a dynamic where if you're not in the crew, um, if, if, if you're not accepted, it can create a toxic, uh, a, a toxic environment. Um, but for the most part, that's where that bond comes from. That's where that brotherhood comes from. There's this, there's these group of people who come to work who initially then become a family. Nice, nice. Um, Steve Bushimi, you ever get a chance to meet him? No, not yet. I'm sure y'all have a lot to talk about when you do. Yeah. You got on, you came into the department in 96. Yes. The world was rocked and changed forever in 01. Where were you on September 11th, 2001? Yeah, so like I said, when you, the greatest thing about the fire department is you can, you can have a lot of free time off. So with that free time off, I used to work a lot of jobs. I used to still dance with my dance company. Um, I used to take acting classes. Um, one of the jobs I had was doing security for Fashion Week at Bryant Park. Yep. So I used to escort, I remember I escorted Michael Jackson's mom. Um, Serena Williams, Puffy, Dame. I used to escort like a lot of the celebrities into these high, these fashion shows. So I was uh, there with another firefighter. Uh, and when the first plane hit, this guy had about 10 years on. Um, and the guys running the show were court officers, retired, a lot of court officers. And they came up to me and they said, hey, it's a total recall. You gotta go to work. I'm young, I only have five years on the job at that time. I didn't even know what a total recall was. Um, and I remember on 42nd and 6th Avenue, it's a Starbucks now, it used to be a Radio Shack. And I remember running over to Radio Shack, they had all the TVs in the window and they kept showing the plane hitting this building. And you know, I'm looking at a TV, it don't look real. But then uh, me and my man, we jumped in my car, uh, we drove up 6th Avenue. I remember seeing a van, it was crushed. And this guy was like, oh, something fell out the sky, hit my van. We drove up 6th Avenue, jumped to Central Park, up behind 10th Street, I dropped him off at his firehouse, which is four blocks from mine. I went to my firehouse. Uh, they loaded us all up on a bus. Uh, we took the West Side Highway down. By the time I got down there, Building 1 and Building 2 had come down. So we had started to evacuate, um, I think, Building 7. Um, and it was at that time when I'm looking at Building 7 and it's on fire, and I remember hearing the chief being like, everybody get out, it's coming down. And I was like, no way in the world is building coming down. Like it's not coming down. And then all of a sudden it just said, do, 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 do. And everybody started running. But um, I, I ended up being down there for, for a long time after that. Um, lost a couple of good friends. Uh, I had a brother named Sean Powell, who's from Engine 207. He worked in my firehouse for a year, but then he transferred back to Brooklyn. Um, had another, my first captain, Patty Brown, he was in my firehouse when I first got there, but then he went to another firehouse, um, Steve Bates, he responded from Brooklyn. Um, and then I also spent two years in Brooklyn also. So a whole lot of brothers, Leon Smith, Vernon Cherry, Davison, 
Um, there's a lot of good dudes that I knew um, that, that passed away. And because, you know, we didn't have a large number of African-Americans, all 12 black firefighters that died in 9-11, I kind of personally had a relationship with all of them. Oh, man. You, you know, you just skated through this, and I'm going to back you up for just a little bit because it, this is, it, it had to be a life-changing moment for you personally. I remember at the time, you know, I am heavily in the music industry, uh, working at Bad Boy Records. And we didn't, you know, I didn't have to be in the office until 10 a.m. And I remember that day, literally about on my way down, about to leave the house. And I see these, and, and it's just surreal, right? It, 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 it is surreal. So you don't know what to make of this because you ain't never seen nothing like this in your lifetime. So I'm calling around and I'm, do we still got to go into work? Like I'm not taking it in the gravity and the magnitude of it. It didn't hit me yet. And I remember when I finally did make it to Manhattan, every, and I think that this is when, yes, it hit me because I watched the buildings drop on television. But if you lived in New York at that time, going into Manhattan and seeing all of those missing signs, that for, for me, that's when, yes, I saw what happened on television, like most people, but walking through a vacant Manhattan and seeing people everywhere with thousands of flyers, putting them up on poles, have you seen such and such? That's when it all started to be like, like, damn, like 3,000 lives were lost. Like these people are not coming back. Yeah. As you are going down that West Side, like when did it become real for you? Like, I understand that you went down there to talking about, you know, building one and building two dropped already. You, you mentioned that uh, your captain was saying, get out of building seven. Like, when did you... Yeah, it didn't hit me until I don't know how many days after a friend of mine came up to me in a firehouse and he knew I was, he knew me and Sean Powell were really close. Um, and he came up to me um, and he's like, yo, dude, here's the list that everybody missing. Sean Powell's on the list. So I took out my cell phone. I called like Sean Powell ain't on the list. I called a number and Sean Powell didn't answer. I think um, that's when it really, really sunk in. I was like, yo. Um, because I, I think I believe that we was just going to find everybody somewhere under the rubble. Um, but when I saw the list, the paper list of all of these pages and the names, uh, uh, and I remember I went up to the top floor in the firehouse and I probably cried. Um, but that's when it really hit me that something wasn't right. Wow. Yeah, my condolences. And again, man, I got to thank you for your service. Like that, that, that moment in time is, uh, you know, it stands alone in the history of our planet. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to ask you, you're a fighter, firefighter and you're deep in this thing. You mentioned all the while you're doing uh, plays and I'm assuming you're doing little uh, theater wherever you can get it. When did acting truly become real? Because I, I, I want to, for our audience, people, people think, especially when they, they're locked into a job for a certain amount of time, that this is it. This is all it's going to ever be. I'm going to do this and I'll retire and I'm going to go off into the sunset. My life ends. You continue to dream, like, and, and, and it's bold of you, actually. When, at, at what point did you start getting serious about acting? And tell me about making that decision. I'm going to retire. I'm not going to do no more years. I'm going to really pursue this acting thing full time. Yeah, it was twofold. I think one was, you know, I was dancing and the last big gig I did, I was a correction officer at the time, I used my vacation and I toured with Gloria Gaynor. <laughs> I went with her to Brazil, Germany. Will, for everybody who don't know, you should know that name. I will survive. Yeah, I went to London. And then I was also dancing with another uh, 
uh, company called Forces of Nature. I, but I think I was dancing, I loved it, but I was getting to a point where it was like, you know, the, the, the thrill of it was starting to wear off. Or I did a, a, I did a dance piece called Shaka Zulu. Um, and we did another piece called La Cabeza at the Apollo. And it was about this great African uh, king and warrior. And something about playing that role and mixing theater with dance was appealing to me. Um, and I was like, hey, let me, let me try this acting thing. And I remember the first thing I saw was Spike Lee was doing an audition for Clockers. So I go into this auditorium. Actually, they picked me. It was me, Makai Pfeiffer, this other brother from Harlem. Um, but I think I was too old for the role. So they gave me a little extra role. So if you look at Clockers, I'm, I'm in from the beginning. I'm got a gold chain. I'm dead on the street. <laughs> and that, so that was my first role. But then I was like, OK, let me start taking classes. And, First place I went to was a place called NEC, which was Negro Ensemble Theater Company. That's where Debbie Allen, Sam Jackson, Denzel, that's where all the legends went. So I went but there. Didn't, is, is that the same um, company that uh, Rock, Christopher, Chris Dutton? Is he out of that same? All of them, all the black actors in the 60s and 70s, that's where everybody went to get their chops. So Sydney, all of them. So that's where I went. They had like this three or four month intensive workshop. I took it. Um, Denzel Washington came to the graduation and, and the performance um, and that kind of, that was 1998. And I was like, okay, I like this, you know, let me build on this. So then I started doing like a lot of, I was in a comedy uh, theater company for a while. I was doing any and everything, you know, college plays. And um, 2004 or 2005, the cast, no, maybe 2003, the casting director says, hey, I want you to come be a reader for this movie, Notorious. They're doing a story of uh, Biggie Smalls. I was like, all right, I didn't know what a reader was. So I go in and a reader is someone who reads opposite everybody else auditioning for the role. So I'm like, damn, I'm not even gonna get to audition. I gotta read for people. So you gotta remember, this is after The Wire. So I see Jamie Hector coming in. Um, I'm seeing all of these Wire people coming in. I'm like, holy shit. And, <laughs> and I was, Jamie Hector blew me away with his audition. And I was like, I'm, I'm messing around. Like these people are serious and they hungry. And my firefighter check had kind of lulled me to sleep. And I was like, you know what? I got to turn this up a notch. So that's when I learned, I started looking at headshots. I started studying where people went to school, where they were taking classes. And I started going to all of these places to take classes and study. Um, because there was a point, and I remember somebody told me, you know, I was a firefighter, I was strapped, had muscles bulging, looked pretty good. So from that aspect, I was getting those type of pretty boy roles. But when it came down to emotional work, layers work, um, I was going in room and I was getting chewed up. I didn't even know how to compete because I didn't have the training. Um, so I had to humble myself and then I was like, all right. And it's funny that you mentioned Charles Dutton because I went to an intensive workshop with Tasha Smith. Um, Natasha Smith. So she had her, her guess, her special guest was Charles Dutton. So he gets up there and he speaks. And I asked Charles Dutton, I said, hey, look, man, you know, I got a son, I'm married, I got a mortgage, a house. Um, I'm a firefighter. I can't go to LA at the time. That's where everybody was going. If you were serious, I was like, what do I do? Like, I, I want to take this acting thing serious. And Charles Dutton said, hey, look, I'm not going to lie to you. If you can go to college and immerse yourself in the arts, nothing's going to beat that experience for four years. But he said, if you can't do that, he said, find a way to make it work. Take classes like this, take other classes, train with this person, train with that person. And that's what I started doing. Um, there's a woman by the Natasha Smith. I remember she said to me when I took a class, she was like, why are you not working more? Why are you not da, da, da? And I was like, she was like, you need to take classes with this person. And it was Susan Batson. So Susan Batson's an old school black woman coach. She does, she to this day, she still coaches Nicole Kidman. She, uh, I think she coached Puffy for, uh, was it Monster he was in? Monster. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I started taking classes with Susan Batson. And um, that's when all of the stuff that you mentioned about, you know, the effect that a mother has on you. So I was very good at expressing anger, being physical, rah, 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 rah. 
But Susan Batson broke me open with this whole type of emotional work where it was like, look, you got some baggage. And it was really the pain of my mother specifically um, that was really keeping me from, from, from uh, pr moving up the, the next step. And, and she used to say, your life problem is your acting problem. <laughs> so and my life problem was I was this arrogant, unemotional, on the surface type of dude. So I had, she cracked me way open. Um, and But her classes were Monday nights from six at night to like four in the morning. Oh, wow. And I lost many girlfriends because for a year, I was in that class religiously. And I don't think my girlfriends at the time understood. They were like, you in an acting class from six to four? Like, come on now. Like, that don't make no sense. <laughs> but I was like, no, I, I, I even quit the job at fashion week because i was all all the little jobs i had i used to work for this antique show i used to work at fashion week security all of those jobs i quit and people was mad girlfriends left me but i was like this is what i'm passionate about this is what i'm doing sometimes i would get off at four in the morning go straight to the firehouse sleep and get up and go to work at eight nine o'clock and i did that for a year but that was probably one of the biggest um the biggest things I, I gift that I could give to myself as far as just doing that emotional work and really taking my acting work to the next level. Um, so that, you know, it, that, that was late 2004, 2005. And then I started booking law and order. Then I just started seeing that the training was working, which even pushed me to get more training. So then I left Susan Batson. I went to another woman, Mary T. Boyer, who gave me the tools to, you know, just to really, do stuff for, it was it, it just became really fun um but the the issue was even in the firehouse you know i'd get a call hey you got to audition tuesday and i would spend so much time getting off on tuesday to go to the audition but not really prepare for the audition um so i got teased a lot about oh you need it off you went to the audition you didn't get it blah 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 but i kept at it kept at it and then I booked a, a film with Reggie Bifewood, who's the husband of Gina Bifewood, who did Love and Basketball. I booked a film called Gun Hill, where I was opposite Lorenz Tate. Um, I went to Little Rock, Arkansas, did Raising in the Sun, which was another um, highlight in my life where I got to play Walter Lee, um, got my equity, got my union. Um, and it just slowly started to snowball and build. And I remember back in the days, people were like, oh, if you're serious, you need to go to LA, this, that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I can't leave my son. That's not gonna happen. Can't leave my job, I've got responsibilities. Um, but I always used to tell myself, I'm gonna do 20 years in this job. I'm gonna book a show in here and that's gonna be it. And in my 17th year in the fire department, you know, I got an audition for Blacklist. It was on a Saturday in July. I was about to blow it off. I was like, nobody doing no audition in July and Saturday, but I went, plus there was no lines. But I went, did some improv, they called me back. I'm a very avid snowboarder. Um, I booked a trip to Chile. Um, they told me I booked the episode. I was like, okay, I, I can do it. But I think it was like August 8th, I was leaving for Chile. And then they said, oh, we need you for the next episode. And I remember like, damn, I'm gonna miss the first week of my Chile trip. And then uh -huh. they was like, oh, we need you another episode. And I told my manager, I'm like, I just paid $3,500 for this Chile trip. Like, I can do this. And my manager is like, look, you're going to be able to go to Chile another time. But I'm a person like as much as I work hard, I like to play. And snowboarding is, is how I played. I was, that's life for me. So, um, and, you know, I went to Chile two years later, but Blacklist went from one episode to two to a year to another year. And then my third year, which also lined up with my 20th year in the fire department, because what most people don't know is even though I, I was on TV, I was still at the firehouse for two years. I was juggling both. Did the TV show Monday through Friday. I did like 40, 48 hours at the firehouse, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and then they gave me a six year contract with a little bit more money. It was hard because all my life I had been getting a paycheck every two weeks. At the same time, I had younger brothers who always hit me up for money and family mm -hmm. members, and a son. So it was a little scary leaving a paycheck every two weeks, but at the same time, I had prayed for this. I had dreamed for this. So I had to uh, 
kind of step out and, 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 and accept the blessing. And, and I, I retired from the fire department and went straight into full-time uh, the blacklist. Whoa, uh, before I let you go, mm -hmm. James Spader, mm -hmm. how's it working with him? I mean, it's amazing. I mean, that's where I think, um, I mean, of course, black men in Harlem, I think I could go toe to toe with anybody. But I, I, I definitely say after spending eight seasons working with him, seeing how he works, see how, seeing how particular he is, seeing the work he puts into um, everything, it, it's given me the courage. It's given me the um, belief that um, I, I really think that I can step on stage with anybody now just from um, rocking with him because he's an he's a intense <laughs> and... Uh, powerful actors so um um i think i'm really ready right now so i mean it's been a it's really been a blessing um just to sit back and watch him work it's almost like being in class again so um i'm you know i'm taking everything put it in my pocket and uh carrying it with me whenever i i, I take on another project you spoke so highly of your father throughout this interview I know you're a father. Mm. What type of father are you? What type of father am I? Wow, that's, you know, it's interesting because I, I had my first son at, uh, uh, in 98, so he's 22 right now. And I just had another son uh, who's three months. So I've been looking at just the journey of Hisham Taufik and who I was at 28 and who I am at 51. Um, I think when I was younger, um, because the, I would say the biggest growth for me uh, is probably emotionally. Mm -hmm. So younger, I think I gave my son everything. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him because I was off for the fire department a lot. So I, like, like I said, I would go to him and says, I went to his pre-K school. I think I went to Sesame Place 10 times on the bus as a volunteer. Um, took him camping, took him to DR. Um, me, me, my son and I, we had a we had a special bond. But at the same time, you know, when I got divorced, a lot of it became materialistic. You know, video games and money, and um, even though I took him to Ghana for his twenty first birthday, um, now looking at the son I have now, there's just a whole different type of emotional growth that I have. So it's going to be interesting just using those tools to, to raise a son now. Um, I'm not saying I can't use those tools with my first son, but you know that that window is closed where they become their own man now. So um, they're not too open to uh, 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 a new emotional being when I've helped create this different emotional being that was like me back then. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a hands-on dad. I like to be involved. I'm very spiritual um, in naming my sons. I'm very spiritual um, in, 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 in trying not to impose my beliefs on them. Um, I don't think that works anymore. Like what my father did with me, you have too many distractions, social media and it's just a whole different world. Like now, you, and one thing I learned is you, you know, I can't raise my kids like my father wrote, raised me. It's a different world. You have to use different tactics and different things. There's different hurdles. Um, but I have to be careful too with putting my anxiety, my angst, and, and, and being preachy, preachy. Um, you know, with my new son as I was with my old, my, my firstborn. So I'm, you know, I'm a dad that's that's there. You know, I'm always going to be there. I'm always going to support. I'm going to try to help you pursue any dream you want, um, maybe to a fault. Um, but um, I'm still growing and learning. But I would say now I'm, I'm just much more of a emotionally connected being, which helps me be more connected to my children. Beautiful. Being a 51-year-old man, successful, had multiple careers. For all of the dreamers, for all of the people who are sitting in an office, working at a job, 
that they know I want more. I have a burning desire in my heart to do something more. And I actually even know what it is. But maybe I feel I'm too old. Maybe I feel I'm past my prime. I have a mortgage, kid, wife, bills, life. What advice would you give to that person? Not the person who's in high school, not the person who's just starting out. I'm talking about the person who's been on that job that might think that it's over for them. Yeah, I think someone said something to me that was profound the other day. I forgot who I was speaking to, but they said, you have to look at life as a book and it having chapters. I think for most of my life, I looked at it as one big chapter. You know, most of us say, hey, like you said, we're going to do this till we're 60, we retire, that's it. Um, and I never looked at it that way, but when I look back at it, I've, I've, I've treated life as chapters. Now, we got to be careful because there's a fine line between those people that just hop around and never settle down and, 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 and focus on anything. But I think we all know that person, that grandma, that grandfather, that uncle, that aunt who's like, who is bitter, who is upset with the sacrifices they made and maybe look at you like, I could have did that, but dot, 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 dot. I could have did, but I, and I don't want to be that person. And I don't think you don't want to live with regret. Um, so you have to close out, you know, we, we live in this society where we have these boxes and it sounds cliche, but we have all of these pre-made maps that this is the way you're supposed to do it. Go to high school, go to college, get a degree, do this and you will have this. And I remember being in, I don't know what class I was in, an active teacher was like, you know, back in the day, they was like, okay, do this and you can make these little, you can make VCRs and be a millionaire. VCRs are obsolete now. So now, you know, all that training you did, what are you gonna do with that? So I think we have to be careful about looking at other people's roadmaps for our lives. Yes, there is a roadmap that you need Sometimes you don't need a roadmap, but I truly believe, um, and one of the things my acting teacher used to make us do, we would come in class, they would give us a coloring book. And we would have to get on the floor with a whole bunch of crayons and color a kid's coloring book. And she did that because she said, I want you to return to your kid self. I want you to dream. I want you to have fun. I don't want you to have fears. I want you to just breathe and live life. And I think if we can all return back to that kid self, I mean, right now you tell somebody you want to do something, you tell somebody your dream, they're going to shoot it down. Yep. Make you doubt yourself. But I was a person who, shit, yeah, I want to go to the NFL. Okay, no, now I want to be a lifeguard. Oh no, I'm a Marine. Oh, I want to be a firefighter. No, I'm dancing. I like, I'm following my dreams. Like, I don't care if you tease me, say that's gay or it's not gonna happen or I didn't get the audition. I'm gonna continue to dream. And I think one of the things that always made me a dreamer was probably not having a mother and a father. So I was always thinking or believe, I remember I used to be like, can I just be a superhero? Just escape this, you know? So I was always dreaming of how to escape there's the, the, not really the poverty because my family made sure I had everything I needed, but it was just but at the materialistic poverty, um, the things I thought I needed to have, I, you know, just the pain of not having parents. I was always dreaming of how do I escape this? Um, and that dreaming just stayed with me as I grew. Um, so I would tell everybody, we all have dreams. I mean, even if it's, I meet people now who just make quilts. I don't care if you make an eggnog and selling it or a quilt 
or taking care of cats or opening up a hot dog business. We have dreams. What happened to your dreams? We can't say that I have a son or I have a daughter, I have a wife. Yes, that only makes it harder. That doesn't swallow up your dream. It's still there. Now you have a choice. You're going to work harder to pursue it or you're going to give in or acquiesce. Um, it, I, I just don't believe in giving in and giving up. I have to try every single avenue and I got to get what I want. That's I'm, I'm getting it. So it's going to happen some yeah. way. Um, and I, and it's great that you asked that question. Cause I had this dude in my acting class. Um, and I remember Denzel speaking to both of us when we got out and this dude was bad. And I remember one day on wall street, 48th and park. And I see him walking and I'm like, Oh snap such and such how you doing and he's like oh how you doing i'm like are you still acting he's like oh no man I'm not. and it just broke my heart seeing him doing the wall street thing now knowing how talented he was but for some reason he didn't pursue that dream yeah and i think it's really important not only to pursue your dreams but surround yourself with dreamers because I can tell you right now, when I was in Susan Batson's class from 6 to 4 a.m., Rob Morgan was in there. I don't know if you know who he is. He's doing everything right now. Tobias was in there. Uh, there's so many Black men and women that was in that class with me that were dreaming, and they're out, and they're successful right now. But what do we all have in common? We were in a class dreaming together. And not saying you can't dream along with a whole bunch of non-dreamers, but it's definitely going to be harder. So surround yourself with some like-minded people to have. And I'm not, you know, it's not even just black and white. It's just the ideology. It's the mindset. And if you surround yourself with those type of people, I think you have, it's very hard for you to fail. Beautiful, beautiful. Well said. Besides seeing you on TV every week, <laughs> Where can my audience find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at HishamTaufik.com or HishamTaufik. You can find me on Hish, uh, Instagram at HishamTaufik. You can find me on Facebook at HishamTaufik. But Instagram is my playground mostly. Um, but that's, that's where you can find me. Or you can probably catch me walking around Harlem sometimes. <laughs> Hisham, you, you do realize your name is not Greg or Anthony, right? Absolutely. You got to spell that out, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to spell it out and give you another story I haven't told many people. So, Hisham, you spell it H-I-S-H-A-M. And I'll tell you a joke that lets people really remember. His ham. And I say that because when I was in high school, junior high school, I was Muslim, had my kufir on my garb and everything. I'm in an English class and the English teacher writes on the board, his ham is burnt. And being dark skinned, everybody just connected it. And I remember getting teased, you know, especially as dark skinned high school kids are cruel. But um, that told me how to tell people how to spell my name <laughs> is ham. So his ham is Hisham. That's, uh, that's a, a easy way to remember how to spell it. And Taufik is uh, T-A-W-F-I-Q. Hisham Hafik, I salute you. Thank you. I thank you. Um, I'm so happy you gave us this time and drop so many life gems, uh, really planted so many seeds that I'm sure our audience is gonna walk away from and learn from your story and be empowered in their own. I thank you, my brother. I appreciate the service that you have given over the course of your life and you are a true power move maker. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you for creating a platform so we can uh, share our stories and inspire. Absolutely. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. 
And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.